Hello everyone. Thanks Marlene for the introduction. I tried to keep it short so we quickly get into the panel and this exciting one hour and a half discussion on how craft and making can, for example, re-narrate unseen uh, politics and histories of, of certain marginal groups and, 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 and individuals and communi communities. We will also listen more carefully to how seemingly non-scientific objects of craft have shaped the modern science or the perception of modern science. We will also discuss how authenticity of craft might be context-driven and re relational, and how basically the idea of authenticity would be negotiated and contested by different groups and, and different individuals. In all these papers today, the discussion of what craft is, by who it's practiced, and to which places and institutions it travels, affirm an emerging and critical understanding of craft as an expanded field that should acknowledge its engagement and encounter and intersections with other practices and epistemologies. So the first presentation entitled Stitching the Transatlantic Quilting Diplomacy and Activism in the 19th Century would be presented by Ray Barnes and Stephanie Beck uh, Cohen. Dr. Ray Barnes is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University specializing in globalization of American culture. She is the author of forthcoming book, Darkology, When the American Dream Wore Blackface. Dr. Stephanie Beckwin is the director of university partnerships and internship programs at the US History Scene. She is creating a forthcoming exhibit of Liberian quilts at the International Quilt Study Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The second presentation, <coughs> entitled Scientists of Form, Craft and Morphology in the Late 19th Century would be presented by Laura Weikoff. She is a PhD candidate in History of Science at Yale University. And finally, the last presentation, Authentic, the Art of Labor, Performance and Praxis, would be presented by Alicia, Dr. Alicia Ori de Nicola, who is an assistant professor of anthropology, associate professor of anthropology at Oxford College of Emory University. Her recent co-edited book is called Critical Craft, Technology, Globalization, and Capitalism. So I would like to welcome our first presenters, Raylene Barnes and Stephanie Beckman. Um, great, thank you. So um, it's, uh, I just want to say, first of all, it's wonderful to be back here at the VGC. I did my master's here many years ago. Um, I'm now uh, at Yale as a historian of science, but I retain my identity as a historian of uh, material culture, decorative arts, craft design, all those names that uh, the VGC has adopted over the years. Um, at first blush, making distinctions between natural and artificial objects seems straightforward. Take, for example, these two objects. On the left, we seem to have the epitome of a natural thing, a plump apple with a rosy tint and freckled skin. The object on the right, characterized by garish colors and 90 degree angles, seems like it must be a human fabrication. However, the origin story of both these objects is not so straightforward. The Honeycrisp apple on the left is the result of decades of work by scientists at the University of Minnesota who crafted their new apple from heirloom cultivars dating back hundreds of years. The bismuth crystal on the right grew entirely on its own, but only after the element had been extracted from the earth and refined in the laboratory. So both these objects, therefore, are partly the product of human craft and partly the result of biological and chemical processes. Rather than an explicit binary, they exist on a continuum between natural and artificial. Their identity is neither fixed nor absolute. The way in which objects and processes have been divided into categories of natural and artificial has changed across cultures and over time. Long before we started sorting things into museums of art and natural history, for example, the Wunderkammer of early modern Europe made space for hybrid objects such as this drinking vessel fashioned by the workshop of Wenzel Jamnitzer in the 16th century. The pearly shell of the body was formed by an organism called a nautilus over the course of its nearly 20 year lifespan somewhere in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Humans stripped the shell of its original coloring to reveal its iridescent nacre 
and mounted it in a gold and silver fixtures uh, in the lofty shape of a chicken. Um, the shell chicken stands on a base mimicking a patch of turf, complete with little lizards cast from life. Discussions of the relationship between making and knowing have often focused on objects from the early modern period, like the cup I just showed. Historians of craft, such as Pamela Smith, have demonstrated the deep linkages between making and knowing in the early modern period, and how the artificial manipulation of materials in the studios of artisans, including Yamnitzer, built a foundation of natural knowledge that set the stage for the scientific revolution. However, the limited spread of this the, the limited temporal spread of this important scholarship gives the impression that modernity and its processes of professionalization and secularization imposed a permanent rift between science and art. So the fusion of art and science always seems to exist in a time apart from our own, either as a bygone unity that expired along with Leonardo da Vinci or as an optimistic vision of an inspired techno future. However, I'd like to suggest that the overlap of art and science exists in mundane ways, in mundane but important ways in the modern era, including our own. The tacit knowledge gained through the manipulation of materials did not go away once the professional category of scientist emerged in the 19th century. Rather, it was incorporated in both explicit and subtle ways into scientific arguments. Scientists use craft as a way to build their own expertise and construct authority and construct the authority of science itself. They too drew lines between what counted as natural and artificial, using their knowledge of craft to, to, to bolster their power and speak on behalf of the natural world. So my research explores a group of individuals caught between the worlds of craft and science in the later 19th century. Their professional Professional activities might have identified them as either scientists or artists, but they had a shared body of practices and processes. In today's talk, I use the example of one particular individual, Edward, Edward Sylvester Morse, who used his deep knowledge of craft to support the arguments he made about the form of the natural world. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about a field of study that was central to 19th century science, morphology. So morphology is the study of the form of organic things. It emerged as an important methodology around the turn of the 19th century. Like many exciting ideas in 19th century biology, it came from Germany. Uh, the term was first invoked by the polymath Johann Wolfgang von Goethe as an approach to investigating the metamorphosis of plants. So we think of Goethe main, these days mainly as a poet or a playwright, but he was also deeply interested in the sciences of optics and botany, and he kept a large botanical library, a uh, specimen, specimen library, of which uh, this is an example. So Goethe proposed the, a comparative study of natural form as a way to understand how plant forms were related. He believed that through such comparisons, the investigator could discern the form of the urplant, the archetypical plant from which all others, all others were derived. So he believed basically that all plants could be understood uh, as variations on the form of a leaf. So um, if the leaf is the ur form, if you extend it, it becomes a stalk. If you multiply it, it becomes a flower. And so it's this manipulation of this basic form. Uh, comparing mature specimens of different species was not enough, however. To truly understand how plants were capable of manifesting such different forms, the investigator must examine the same organism through time, relating the forms of leaves, petals, and stamens both forward and backward in time to see how one structure transformed into another. So from the beginning then, morphology implied two important things, that the relationships between two or more natural objects could be inferred through the act of comparing their physical forms, and also that form held a record of change over time. In this way, this new science of morphology distinguished itself from the classic science of anatomy. It had the power not only to describe the form of things, but also how they had come to be that way. So by the mid 19th century, the term had been widely adopted in the study of the natural world. Um, and you see a visualization of it here in action as a way to recognize uh, similarities between mammalian limbs. Historian of biology, Lynn Neihart, has argue, argued that morphology was an orientation rather than a distinct discipline. It was, a, it was an approach that could be and was uh, widely applied to a range of natural and artificial objects. 
the morphological orientation quickly outgrew botany and was taken up by scientists across the academy, including in uh, geology and zoology. Elsewhere in my work, I have explored how scientists arrange artworks, artworks into evolutionary stories using the logic of morphology. However, I'd like today to focus on a different cross-fertilization of ideas between science and craft, how the knowledge gained through close observation and manipulation of materials, the embodied knowledge of craft, enabled scientific reasoning itself. For a group of scientists who are themselves skilled artisan, artisans, form was a record of nature's craft. So to illustrate this, I'd like to spend a little time talking about the life and career of Edward Sylvester Morse. So the decorative arts historians in the room may recognize Morse's name uh, from the history of Japanese art and architecture. He published hugely popular books on Japanese culture and donated a foundational collection of Japanese ceramics to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. However, his primary professional identity was as a zoologist. It was the study of shells and the animals that made them that have first brought Morse to Japan. Morse's specialty was brachiopods, shelled aquatic organisms that look like mussels and clams but are slightly different um, based on their taxonomy. So as someone whose career straddled art and science, it's not incidental that Morse's attention was drawn to shells. Shells frustrate the assumed boundary between nature and artifice. They have the geometric regularity and lasting presence of an artificial thing and yet are built by animals with either no brain at all or one so small that it's wrapped around their esophagus. <laughs> Unlike other semi-permanent organic things such as bones or fingernails, they're not made of cells but rather crystallized minerals. So kind of like the bismuth crystal I started with, the animal assembles the right elements in the right place and the crystal grows on its own. Furthermore, shell status as a natural thing is blurred by the way they have been rolled into human life over millennia as tools, ornaments, and as currency. As a child growing up in Maine, Morse amassed a huge collection of seashells and became a regular member of the local naturalist society. He also developed remarkable artistic skills, being able to draw with both his left hand and his right hand simultaneously, which people just loved. Uh, by his teenage years, he had secured a job as a draftsman for the Maine Central Railroad, making technical drawings and plans for the construction of uh, heavy machinery. He used the money he made from this drafting job to finance his education, and in 1859, he went to Harvard to study with a famous naturalist, Louis Agassi, at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. So Agassi was famous for his case study method, uh, where new students would be given a single specimen and expected to spend several days getting to know everything about it from close observation. So no books, no, uh, no comparative objects, just a single specimen. So while Morse eventually disagreed with Agassiz's stance on evolution, he embraced the methodology that put close observation at the very center of scientific practice. For Morse, drawing was more than recording. It was a way of thinking through observation and a way of reasoning about construction. He stressed the role of drawing as a tool for learning, advising all aspiring zoologists to make meticulous drawings of specimens. So in 1875, he published a children's book on zoology, and for the first lesson, he suggested that children collect and observe mollusks and their shells, like the assortment you see here. And this drawing, like almost every illustration in one of Morse's publications, is based on one of his own drawings. He recommended that children make drawings of the shells as a way to hone their skills of close observation. He contended that looking alone rendered only an imperfect idea of a specimen. Rendering it by hand illuminated new features of the objects and, as he said, repaid all the trouble spent in the task. He especially wanted to train children to see how shells recorded their own growth. He pointed out the delicate lines of growth that showed how a shell had been crafted such as in this diagram, where he showed how small shells can grow into big shells through the slow accrual of material. So these could conceivably all be the same shell, but at different stages in its life. Um, and so the dotted lines show where the shell would have expanded if it were still alive. Um, and a similar view from the top. So this sort of structural thinking was not simply for education or entertainment. Morse had used a similar line of reasoning in his most sa famous scientific work, a paper arguing that the brachiopods, despite their visual similarity to clams, were actually more closely related to worms. 
So it was his interest in brachiopods that brought Morse to Japan. There were only a handful of species native in North America. Japan, on the other hand, had dozens. His first trip lasted three years, and when he got there, he was invited to join the faculty of the brand new Imperial University in Tokyo, where he taught evolution and zoology to, uh, to students. He also became deeply fascinated by Japanese art and culture, especially the ceramics. According to his biographer, it was a hybrid object of nature and art that first brought his attention to the medium. So while he was in the market one day, he noticed a dish in the form of a scallop or pectin shell. And I'm not sure if this is the exact one, but this one was in Morse's collection and is now at the MFA. Charmed by the craft person's mimicry of his scientific specialty, he embarked on an extensive study of Japanese ceramics. Morse was fascinated with ceramics that mimic shells, several of which are now uh, at the MFA in Boston. And here's a few examples. So these were not the kind of objects that were valued by Japanese collectors. These were pretty, could, considered pretty lowbrow um, when he started buying these. Uh, and he eventually trained his eye in this area too uh, and becoming a much more sophisticated connoisseur. So none of these objects are on display now because they're not considered quite like the fine example of Japanese ceramics. While he later developed a more discerning eye for quality, these zoomorphic ceramics always held a particular appeal for Morse. When he donated them to the MFA, he described many by their scientific name rather than the common English or Japanese term, suggesting that the artistic representations were accurate enough to classify by taxon. So for example, he also collected a lot of vessels that look like birds, and they're all just described as vessel in the form of a bird, <laughs> nothing more specific than that. Um, some examples of the shell ceramics, such as the haliotis or abalone shell dish seen here, uh, had glazes that mimicked the iridescent interiors of seashells themselves, adding a further level of play between nature and artifice. So from his combined intellectual interests, we see that Morse was keenly interested in how the natural world had gained its form and brought a craft sensibility to the interpretation of the natural world. Towards the end of his career, he brought his enthusiastic faculties and distinguished eye to a new and otherworldly problem. Percival Lowell, Morse's good friend and fellow Japanophile, started publicly advocating for the existence of intelligent life on Mars in the 1890s. The idea was surprisingly popular. Italian astronomer Giovanni Scaparelli had started the conversation 20 years earlier when he published a map showing a number of channels or canals on the planet's surface. Lowell, who was independently wealthy, developed a passion for astronomy and built a private observatory near Flagstaff, Arizona in order to get to know Mars a little better. So Lowell interpreted what he saw through his telescope as a network of massive irrigation channels. And here's one of his representations of what he observed. After visiting his friend at the observatory and mulling over the evidence, Morse published a book supporting Lowell's argument in 1906. Mars and its Mystery is a slim but fascinating book. While Morse's goal was to support Lowell and his arguments, the book routinely dips into philosophical questions about the inescapable subjectivity of vision. For example, Morse admits that he, when he looked through his friend's telescope, he couldn't actually see the lines that, Mor that Lowell said were there. Um, but he reflected on this and said, well, in my practice, when I'm doing dissections of these tiny marine creatures, no one else can see the anatomical features that are so obvious to me. And so therefore, I trust his trained eye to see these things. Um, so he really takes Lowell's word for it that, that what he sees is there. Um, so Morse attached his attention to one detail in particular, the nature of the lines that Lowell had observed, as you can see on the uh, globe on the, on the left. A prevailing theory about the channels was that they were marks created through the cooling of the planet's surface when, after it had first formed and of, therefore not at all connected to alien life. So some believe this was how the moon and the position uh, and portions of the Earth's surface had come to be covered in mountains, that they were essentially really big wrinkles. Um, British astronomers James Naismith and James Carpenter had previously argued that the moon's surface had been formed this way uh, 
And in order to support their argument, they took a photograph of an elderly person's hand and a shriveled old apple, dramatically lit as if to replicate the effect of reflected light on the moon. But when it came to Mars, Morse vehemently disagreed with the cooling theory, and he turned to his knowledge of ceramics to prove it. He stated, in order to pronounce the lines on Mars as simply cracks, one should study the various kinds of cracks and similar surfaces on Earth. In, the study, in such a study, one would be amazed at the similarity of cracks, whether in the almost microscopic crackle of old Satsuma pottery or in huge cracks in sun-dried mud. Morse went on to compare Lowell's globe of Mars to an object that had been marked by the way it cooled, a ceramic bowl. The crazing, as Morse pointed out, tended to occur in short lines, rarely converging into concentrated centers. The crazy lines, as well as the cracks in the mud, formed short discontinuous lines that begin and end without definition. The channels on Lowell's globe, on the other hand, had clear points of convergence. So they come into these centers that are marked and aren't these sort of disjointed little segments. Um, Morse devoted a, devoted a two-page spread uh, to comparing natural and artificial lines. Um, so here, here you see them, and they're organized by scale generally, so smallest on the top, largest on the bottom, and divided into natural and artificial. So over here on the natural side, we have pottery, crackle at two inches, mud cracks, asphalt cracks, earth cracks at 10 feet, uh, the craters of the moon, and on the lower right, uh, example B is the Great Rift Valley in Africa, which is like the biggest crack you could find. Um, on the right, we have the artificial lines, railroads, uh, streets, irrigation canals, and on the bottom right, the two maps of Mars. So uh, Schiaparelli's map on the left and Lowell's globe on the right. So through Morse's interpretation and the way he structured uh, this diagram, um, we can see that the signature of lines uh, on Lowell's globe is not evidence of a natural cooling process, but the clear evidence of intelligent intervention. Um, so as I suggested in the beginning, I believe that artificial and natural things exist on a continuum rather than a distinct binary. The decision about where exactly to cleft art from nature has been determined by historical circumstance and the politics of labor and knowledge. In this case, Morse took an ambiguous observation and used his craft experience to interpret the evidence. In order to support his friend and the authority of his science, he declared the channels on Mars to be artificial. So the Martian canals are often held up as an example of, of an embarrassing and silly blunder in the history of astronomy. However, as historian K. Maria Lane has recently argued, the ambiguous evidence collected through technologies available at the time prompted a very serious philosophical discussion. Morse was aware that he was building an argument on incredibly tenuous evidence and, basing his argument on his friend's testimony of what he had observed, Morse's reasoning was fairly sound. So the artistic abilities of scientists such as Morse have often been described as a lucky bonus that enriched their real and implicitly more important scientific work. However, as I hope to have shown today, artistic and craft ability was part of what made them the right people to, to develop the science of morphology. They had practical skills and trained eyes that helped them discern form and see how things were put together. The craft shaped the knowledge they produced. So I'd like to end today with an invitation for you all to think about how your knowledge of craft speaks for and mediates the natural world. I often find myself speaking to historians of science to try and convince them to pay attention to the artists and the craftspeople, but you already know how important they are. Um, today I hope to have shown you that through your craft expertise, um, you also have the skills to help us think about natural things in new and productive ways. Thank you. See if I can find the right buttons on here. Hi. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a new project that I've been working on um, 
about the authentic. Um, and I'm going to tack back and forth a little bit between that and uh, the book that um, I just finished editing with Claire Wilkinson Weber a couple of years ago um, to talk about craft and ideas of authentic. But um, And this is a paper about looking at craft in Costa Rica, looking at craft in India, and the different kind of discourses that come out of that. But it's also really about the kind of things that Marilyn was talking about earlier. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I don't think there are a lot of us in the audience. There are a few. But um, this is, I, I just want to say how grateful I am to be here in a place where um, I can talk about craft. In anthropology, we're a very small group. And um, I've realized uh, with some of the work that I've done recently that the audience is uh, much larger than anthropology. And it's a, it's a fantastic feeling, and it's a fantastic feeling to be here. So I'm going to shamelessly use you um, in terms of uh, talking about this, this project here for the first time and um, hoping to have a dialogue about where anthropology fits. So I'm going to start by introducing you to my field. And I know a lot of people in here use anthropology and talk about anthropology. But bear with me. I think it'll, the why of it will become a little more clear. That I'm a cultural anthropologist, I think, needs no explanation. But I'm also a semiotician, critically interested in the way that, ways that words and narratives are constructed and marshaled, for what, uh, and for what purposes. In most interdisciplinary spaces, one of the first questions I'm often asked is, how do you define craft? Or how are you defining authenticity? Disciplinarily, my work is not to understand how particular concepts are used and marshaled, and not to argue about them really either, um, not to decide which ones are correct or which ones are acceptable. I'll give you an example regarding craft. In providing this quick illustration, I'm also responding to the following review of our book, Critical Craft, um, by D. Wood in the journal Capital and Class. Wood says, there are 14 essays in Critical Craft, and while the editors state in postmodern fashion, that they choose not to define craft and thereby exclude frontier-breaking contributions, there are two that do not warrant inclu uh, inclusion in a book with craft in the name. Both essays attempt to justify computer programming as a craft practice. But I do not understand why writers from the digital sphere are usurping a word that has long-standing association with tradition, control over work, sustainability, the local and human relationships, as contentious as those terms are proven to be in the acceptable essays. None of these terms are embraced by computerized society. Don't get me wrong, this was an otherwise really lovely um, and glowing review, and we were we, we loved the attention. So, um, But it also serves fairly well to illustrate the place that I find myself often in, um, in talking to interdisciplinary audiences. In studying language, as anthropologists, we certainly define our own terms when we write, but we largely avoid defining others. We're not really interested in defining the ideas we're studying. We're interested in how other people do that. When one begins talking about definitions, specifically about something, what something is, you are, in fact, limiting it. You're drawing boundaries and defining what it isn't as well. Um, you know, thus the name changes in Bard College over and over again, right? Those kinds of things matter to people. Um, People define for reasons that are more than chaotic and arbitrary. Defining is about power. The core, then, of the projects at hand are to ask what other people's definitions are and how such ideas and understandings are marshaled in different places and different contexts. In the case of craft, bear with me, I will get back to authenticity, it turns out that ideas of craft seem to carry over into most contemporary narratives as positively weighted. And while often in subtle and invisible at the surface, it's deeply coded into the central semiotics of the language, so deeply that even researchers and scholars embrace the morality coded into the word itself without actually realizing, I think, that that's what we're doing sometimes. Um, specifically, I want to talk about two specific ideas of authenticity and how they're marshaled differently among artisans and designers in India, and some new work that I've begun recently in Costa Rica. So I'll start out with India. I've spent a decade visiting, learning from, and writing about a small town in Rajasthan, India called Bagru. We talked a little bit about that last night. It's a hand block textile printing town with some interesting claims to heritage and al alongside turn of the century, century movements away from patron client relationships and towards market capitalism. So, um, in, in some people's ideas, away from authenticity. I've recently written about the process of getting the town's printing community GI status, 
GI, or geographical indications, is an internationally recognized legal designation, much like copyright, but given to communities or collectives with a geographic place-based claim to heritage. Obviously, since copyright protects the uniqueness of an individual work, GIs must be thought of differently as they're most often given to groups of artisans with long-time claims to design, place, and the actual soil on which the product is made. They're based on the French term terroir, so if you think about Champagne, Bordeaux, or other wines given appellation of origin, um, you pretty much got the idea. Um, so how does this work with cloth? Uh, first, the recipes for natural um, dyes passed down through pre-colonial generations, usually through women, um, are one of the ways that, that, um, that this works. And, it, and that complicates matters because women tend to move away from their families and don't stay. Um, where they where they were grown up and, and um, learned these skills. Second, on the historically commented upon steadfastness of the dyes, which are attributed to special combinations of minerals in the local water. And since the river in Bagru dried up decades ago, that also creates a bit of a problem. Finally, it's based on the historically documented recognition of Bagru print designs. Um, and you guys will be very familiar. This last criteria, the complication is being able to both continue keeping artisan and design, artisanship and design alive um, while also maintaining a recognizable historical look that belongs in the place. Despite all these demands and complications, Bagru re received geographical indication status in 2011. Um, and I want to I want to point out that GI uses ideas of authenticity as a sort of core assumption of of what it does and why things are protected. Um, the World Trade Organization uh, avoids using such controversial language, but most of the other um, places that kind of talk about uh, tri um, trips and and geographical indications around it regularly use the words authenticity. For in for instance, the American Tea Alliance writes about tea authenticity that is something that should be protected by geographical indications, but is not. Um, Wikipedia's entry on geographical indications says, when products with GIs acquire a reputation of international magnitude, some other products may try to pass themselves off as authentic. So um, all over the place, these, uh, these ideas of geographical indications are, um, are, are steeped in ideas of authenticity. Um, this is obviously only a small number of examples from a larger pool, um, but to bring the point home, I'll give you one more example of uh, one of a number of quotes that a designer um, talking about Bagru artisans um, told me while I was there. Um, the word authentic, again, is not specifically used, but she uses it elsewhere, and this is a really good example of, um, of what she's trying to tell us. Um, this designer from Jaipur tells me that she brings her students to Bagru to get the real understanding of craft. And this is, uh, this is what she takes them to see, basically. Um, and so you have, um, and I don't know uh, if you've never seen this print block uh, work. This is, this, this may actually block um, this, is, this is taller than here. This is the, all three of them together. This piece right here is only two of them. And this is the last, the last piece. And I'll show you the block right here. Um, so it's the carving of the block, the actual, the actual working with the block, the paint, all of that kind of, um, all of that kind of thing, um, and this is uh, this is Dabru work with the mud chips here and the um, uh, and the indigo um, it's there. And so, so she takes them to actually see because, um, and this is what she says: once the students interact with the craftsmen, they realize and they understand what craft is all about, and they pick up about the historical aspect. If they just go to the market, they would not understand what Bagru is. So when they meet the craftsmen, and because they have samples they've been keeping for a long time, they get to see the whole transition of the design from earlier to now. I spoke to many designers in numerous cities, and this narrative is pretty exemplary. It also tells us something about how authenticity is imagined in this particular kind of space, in people's bodies and homes and places, right? Central to this quote is heritage, specifically having one's family and its work established through history in a particular space. So this is just a, this is just to keep you from getting bored while I'm talking. But but it's but it's it's moving forward as well as backwards, right? I mean you can you can see that. Um, common in these wider narratives is talk of grandfathers and great grandfathers doing the same work. Colonial documents recording recording far-reaching knowledge of certain kinds of work in history and place. Aged material culture like these blocks. Embedded in the above quote is the idea that students will not know printing unless they see the craft artisans in their places, not in the market. Also that this is a very generational and place-based kind of um, labor. This interview and many other, others like it suggest that ideas such as real, 
historical, non-market-based, non-capitalist, live artisan, control over process, similarity over time, selfhood, mastery of labor, heart, have meaning and contribute to the importance of understanding something as a craft. While art historians and anthropologists might be cynical about the idea of defining authenticity in any simplistic way, most people know immediately when you're talking, what you're talking about when you ask them whether or not something is authentic. It's more difficult, of course, for them to define the word, and more difficult still for different people to come to terms with other people's definitions. Nevertheless, it, it is a word that will have people nodding their head in mutual understanding. I'm coming to believe that the ideas of authenticity are closely related in a Wittgensteinian game theory sort of way rather than in a dictionary sort of way. So if there is a kind of best, better, good kind of schema to ideas of authenticity, are there parts of the definition that are necessary? Can one talk about authenticity without a claim to heritage, long-term generationally derived skill sets, or recognizable style? And since this is something that I was really used to seeing in India, when I went to Costa Rica, it was something that really struck me as absent. And so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. Um, I ended up doing work in Costa Rica by accident. Very shortly after I began working at my current job, uh, my dean came to me and said, can you take these students to Costa Rica and can you make this pr uh, program that we're already doing more academic? Um, and I was brand new. So I didn't tell him that it's really not a done thing to ask an anthropologist to go to a different place that they've never been before and don't speak the language and try to make something more academic. Um, I did, however, manage to argue that if he wanted me to do it, he was going to have to let me do it as an anthropologist. So, um, so I've started doing work in Costa Rica. Um, and I admit to visiting several times and being kind of distressed and trying to figure out how I was going to connect the work that I do with work in Costa Rica. Um, and I have to be careful saying this because there's a lot of caveats, but Costa Rica is largely lacking a craft industry. Um, when you go into... Uh, the, when you go into San Jose, there's a craft market, and the craft market is full of crafts um, they're, um, in their main shopping center, but you would be hard-pressed to find anything that was actually made in Costa Rica. So there's a lot of stuff made in Ecuador, lots of stuff made in Peru, stuff made in India. Um, Nicaragua is a big import center for all of this stuff, and it's all in this craft market, all labeled Pura Vida and Costa Rica, right? Um, Much of my uh, work on craft suggests that not everywhere, but certainly in Indian Costa Rica, the idea of craft is in intimately and irrevocably linked to tourism and the tourist economy, specifically ecotourism here. In India, it's heritage that rescues it from the inauthentic and the touristic, right? This whole idea of being in place. Um, this might just suggest to some this touristy uh, value in some context that things designed specifically for tourists suggest a disconnect from the authentic. In Costa Rica, this was further complicated by the fact that artists and artisans do not have connection to this sort of heritage work. Um, and only one young man that I talked to had any generational connect connection to the work he did at all. That, even that was only a single generation. This is not terribly surprising considering that the indigenous cultures and ongoing art making traditions were wiped out after European invasion and little was known about these cultures until the 19th century when fruit companies began literally bulldozing for banana plantations and digging this stuff up. Suffice it to say that heritage plays an uncomfortable role in nationalist narratives in Costa Rica. Even so, the country is full of tourist shops. Um, Wikipedia says that by 1995, tourism uh, made more money than bananas, pineapples, and coffee exports combined. There are places um, like the uh, Indigenous Museum in San Jose that feature crafts alongside information about the eight traditionally recognized indigenous communities within Costa Rica, um, but these two have their issues and they're very rare. Instead, souvenirs are, for obvious reasons, found everywhere in small beachside and mountain resort towns like Manuel Antonio and Monteverde. For example, there are two main ways to procure the obligatory souvenirs in Manuel Antonio, a small beach town at the edge of a beautiful state park. One is to walk along the beach and buy jewelry and pottery from artisans who travel up and down looking for buyers. These artisans make their own pottery. These are all handcrafted pottery, right? But they come from Nicaragua. This woman is from Nicaragua. She ba goes back and forth across the border. And, um, and she, when I talk to her, she tells me that um, it's the animals on there that are supposed to remind you of the, the place that, um, 
that you're in, and that that's why handcrafted material is really important. The second way is from semi-permanent artisans up near the park. Up on a hill, a group of lean-to sits at the entrance of the park and across from a row of popular hotels. Here, artisans sit, work, and sell their own and others' art. They will not tell you about their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers' success in the business or talk about cultural heritage. In fact, a jeweler, when asked about culture, art, and authenticity said, we don't try to get you to understand and feel our culture. And she was a little annoyed about it. We live our culture. We are not a culture, but used to seeing different people. We try to show you what a beautiful place this is and the freedom it represents. She talked about this pair of earrings that I bought from her like this. These are two pieces of glass, and in the middle we hand paint with oxidized pigments that get oxygen and trap bubbles within the glass so that it looks like the ocean and reminds you of being here. We try to show you what a beautiful country this is, what it's like to live in a country where you can do anything you want, see whatever you want, and nobody will tell you anything. We don't tell you don't do it because it's disrespectful, no. You do whatever you want, just try to respect the nature. I know some countries try to show you their culture, we try to show you the freedom. We don't have to show you culture, we show you nature. And nature here certainly is a focus. Culture, uh, Costa Rica's tourism boom must give much of its credit to ecotourism. In the cloud forest of Monteverde, where this movement easily took root, the main tourist square is filled with tourist shops. Whoopsie. What did I do? There we go. Um, this tourist shop is the, this is the downstairs of a tourist shop, and it's filled again with these same kinds of things, coffee cups and magnets and, and these kinds of things. Upstairs, though, in this particular tourist shop, are local carvings um, with much more space around them and um, also these heritage masks from the Baruca, which is an indigenous community um, much further to the south. Several miles away, perhaps a mile away from the center of town, you can find less touristy artist co-ops where they sell handmade paper, potholders with rainforest animals hand embroidered onto napkins and potholders, and smoothly carved kitchen utensils. The website says they're a nonprofit artisan cooperative dedicated to enhancing the economic and social well-being of local women artists, and that it began in 1982 in um, a woman's kitchen. But nowhere does it mention that um, this, this movement was started by a group of artists from the United States doing development work um, and working with these women. And these are also set, these, um, these kind of off the beaten track places are set um, for their... Um, they're touristy, but they're for more discerning tourists, and they show that by being, you know, by indexing themselves as outside of the mainstream. So to wrap this up, I do not mean to suggest that Costa Rica's more newly constructed narrative of environmental authenticity is any less important or real than an Indian narrative steeped in generational heritage. I do mean to argue that the idea of authenticity is weighted, differing in each place, and one of the things that often seems to signify, even cross-culturally in this globalized world, is generational connection. Since Costa Rica does not have this clear connection, it must build its ideas of identi identity and authenticity in different ways. Why would this be imp an important issue for artisans? First, the word authenticity is also generationally coded as morally positive. So anything that can claim authenticity is also coded positively. Second, tourists are increasingly looking to buy souvenirs that are coded with terroir, a connection to the land and place, something more than mass produced. If artisans can make buyers see this connection, like the woman who made my earrings, or the potter whose wares depict Costa Rican animals, they're more likely to sell their products. To kind of illustrate some of the issues, um, I want to show you this last photo. The Baruca mask on the left is made by an indigenous artisan who lives nowhere near where I bought it. He just saw a wall of these designs in the other, um, in the other space. The design's based on an unpainted carved wooden mask that used to be made for yearly ritual Dance of the Little Devils. The unpainted mask did not sell terribly well, so artists from outside the community offered suggestions, borrowed from colorfully painted carved animals um, from Oaxaca, Mexico, and you probably will recognize um, that. The second mask is the work of a well-known artist who lives in San Jose and nearby the co-op where I bought both masks. He's one of the Costa Rican artists who has devoted much time into helping the Baruca diversify and update their art to be more saleable. Numerous masks like the first one are now sold around the country as index of Costa Rica's authentic heritage. The second is a piece of authentic local art by a local artisan. Both were sold side by side in one of the out of the way co-ops in Santa Elena. This of course is a narrative about the body making the art rather than the art itself. 
Do ideas of authenticity help us to understand what is going on with these two masks? What does the idea being marshaled do in each case? To things, to artist bodies and indigenous bodies. Ideas of authenticity might begin to look like empty signifiers ready to attach moral freight to any and all work and labor. But is there in fact something that holds these ideas together, even if the connections are tenuous and fraught? And why should we care about such musings? The moral freight of the work and the material culture of labor is important. In this symposium, I suspect I do not have to say that how people understand their work and how they experience it changes with the way they are able to imagine that work and how well it translates to those who buy their products and services. The saleability and desire for the kinds of objects we are talking about at this symposium are often easily and readily connected to ideas of authenticity. And certainly, if we care about making and the meaning of making for both consumer and maker, ideally, then isn't it important to think about how authenticity and craft for that matter are understood and marshaled in practice and what these ideas mean for and about those who make those things. Thank you. Question from audience, and, and, and I thought I would start with one question that often we understood as the boring question, but that's a question of methodology, because I was thinking the whole idea of the panel is the title, you know, crossing and blurring, and, and, and both crossing the disciplinary borders and, and, and also methodological practices, right? And, and three papers. Uh, I mean, two of them more dealing with the historical fact or historical bibliography, and, and in one case it's one individual that we look at practice. In other cases, often it's hard to look at. You know, you don't you, you don't go to the typical archives of Kuwait, or you have to look in other types of archives. Those archives of places that often uh, I mean, policing these individuals or this community. So you have to look at different non craft in the archive. And 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 the third case, even though. We might not see it as history, but still, uh, the idea of authenticity and gen generational things, you know, comes to this also this authenticity marshal to this historical generation. So I was wondering how basically each of you think about your methodological practice. Does this methodology come from, for example, anthropology on the history or history of science, or it's quite hybrid, you know, back and forth? looking at how craft studies or people doing craft basically would, for example, if you think like them, how would they approach the same the subjects you work in? So. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm steeped in my discipline. It's, a, it's a actually a really hard space to get out of, which is one of the reasons why I have repeated over, over, over and over again how grateful I am to be here. Um, and I, I think I see my work as deeply ethnographic. I see the history in it, but I don't, um, there aren't a lot of historians in my work. Uh, I see it as deeply art historian. And um, the other reason I'm really grateful to be here is I once asked an art historian in India um, if she would help me with a project. And she pretty much gave me a, if you don't surf, don't start kind of, um, you know, um, response and so I've, I've been afraid to kind of dabble in that um, for some years and so so this is this is a really lovely kind of place to be um, so so I don't I don't have that I think cross-disciplinary look I see it but it I don't think it's reflected in my work nearly as much as I'd like it to be um, so that's a good good place for me to build <laughs> off of and um, as an art historian uh, also, you know, you're, you're trained in a very specific way. As an art historian who works um, in West Africa, there it was highly encouraged for me to do a lot of anthropology as well, um, and and ethnography, and um, and one of the things that was a major benefit of that was that I was also trained in doing oral history. So um, it's a little bit unusual for. Um, 
uh, it was a little bit unusual uh, for somebody working on the material I was working on to include oral histories um, as part of my art historical research. Um, but fortunately, I had a, a very uh, generous granting institution with a wide um, definition of what archive meant. Um, and that archive could also be uh, situated within people as well. So right. within the quilters I was working with, within their homes and their personal collections, their photograph albums, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it, it has to be necessarily interdisciplinary for me. Um, and I had to draw from alternative methodologies because I could not have done <coughs> my art historical work mm. on quilting mm. without the, the methodologies of anthropology and folklore mm. as well. I think it's interesting, our partnership. So I'm trained in American history, and my book project is on the history of blackface and print culture. But I had this interest in quilts for a very long time. And when I was doing my graduate work at Harvard University, um, my interest in digital humanities and things like quilting was seen as really like, what is this girl doing? <laughs> like, somebody talk to her, stop her. And so I think that this conference is just... Um, proof of how far we've come so quickly. And when I met Stephanie, we both had um, a similar uh, dissertation completion and research fellowship. I sat down next to her and she said she was working on quilts. And I said, oh really? <laughs> Let's have a conversation. And what was interesting is um, my quilt stuff was not seen as serious scholarship until I started putting together that this was a form of critical bibliography, that these women are producing published texts, that they're circulating these, that they're being read, that they're being seen, that there's visual culture. Um, and we sort of combined our training and our methodologies to open new doors. And so I don't think, um, had I been doing this alone, that I would have gotten to um, this level of analysis. And we're, and we're still continuing to, to, to develop that. And so I think that for us, a collaboration and being very interdisciplinary has been incredibly helpful. It speaks to what the panel was, speak, was talking about last night in that there's so much more that you can do together than you can do separately. And it, it really helps to come from both of our fields um, and personal experiences to produce the work that we can now produce. And also there's things that she's discovered that I think are somewhat known in your field. And lately I've been talking with people who are interested in African-American slavery, and I'll say, well, do you know that there's actually these people who are enslaved and they go to Liberia and their documents are there? And so, you know, the ways in which those conversations just about where archives really are um, has been interesting. Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly say that, yeah, my methods are largely historical, shaped by um, history of science STS, but also history of art. Um, but one of my big challenges in, in my dissertation work has been that extreme asymmetry of the types of sources I'm working with when I'm trying to bring together scientists and artists and designers. Um, for this summer I did an archival trip in the UK and uh, encountered several anthropologists who had rooms full of records including everything like their second grade uh, report card and then I go to I go to the VNA to see everything they have on a certain designer and it's one folder with six sheets of paper mm. so con constructing <laughs> stories is is a, you, you just have to look in different ways um to if you want to be systematic about how you compare these two groups of people so, yeah. um so i'm wondering if the question from audience but... okay. i have a question um I kind of want to pull on a thread um, that I think actually ran through all of your papers, which was um, this idea of embodied knowledge or tacit knowledge. Um, and for you all, it seemed an important part of uh, your approach uh, to the objects. And for Laurel, it was sort of important to the subject of your study. And Alicia, I thought you were so um, articulate about the importance of actually words versus the sort of embodied knowledge. And I kind of want to put you on the spot a little bit and ask what your response, um, or if you've ever been asked about or thought about how an anthropologist might go about studying embodied or tacit knowledge um, versus a kind of semiotics approach. Um. I did a short paper for the anthropology of work that was actually on the 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 embodiment of um, of that knowledge in sort of education senses and and the and, and 
and connected to that generational work so that um, there were young people in Bagru who I would ask them what they wanted to do. And, you know, at the age of like nine or 10, they'd say they want to be doctors. At the age of 15 or 16, they'd say, well, I wanted to be a doctor or I wanted to be, a, you know, a, a computer scientist, but this is what I know. I can do this. I've grown up doing this. I, my body knows this. I mean, they'd say things like this. And, um, and this is something that I'm familiar with. And so it doesn't take much to understand it and to be this thing. Um, and so, and so I, I have talked a little bit about the, the actual praxis of it and the practice of it in creating those generational pieces. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe a follow-up question is, um, have you found in your study of authenticity that uh, the practice of craft has been a part <coughs> of kind of creating this idea of authenticity, like important to the practitioner or important, or is it that not... As big oh, as and that's a really interesting question because because that that um, th there's complexities there too, right? In in the when I talked to the jeweler or you know the woman who did pottery in Costa Rica, um, the design process was critical to them, like how how we made it look like this and how we made you feel like this, and and part of and part of how they were designing it and what they were doing. <coughs> in Bagru, um, a lot of the physical practice was was holding the uh, the authenticity of it while the actual design was being extracted from design by designers and so in in that way it was um, it, people were so proud of what they did but the the sort of verbal extraction of that design was really problematic I think to people um, who who would talk about the fact that you know they design things but then they were being kind of you know sort of extracted in that way does that make sense yeah totally Steve so this is a it, it's picking up on the authenticity point so it's I guess maybe immediately related to Alicia's but I think a version could exist for the rest of them as well and it's thinking beyond the sites themselves but I was curious about your thoughts on how performances of authenticity in the sites of craft that you all study relate to performances of authenticity in other spheres, including contemporary spheres of popular culture, like uh, like music, for example, and maybe even contemporary politics, where discourses of authenticity have re reared their ugly head in some ways. Why do I go last? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you're, you're, let me, I'm rethinking your question. It's, it's about place and this kind of practice, the, the, um, the performance of authenticity yeah. and, and performance. Um, so Marilyn was talking about the embodied nature of it. You're sort of talking about a very similar thing, but the, with the practice of it and the watching of the practice of it as creating authenticity. Yeah. And I guess is the discourse of authenticity as it's practiced or performed around craft similar and different from the discourses of authenticity as practiced and performed around things like music, fashion, politics? I think so. And I think, um, I mean, it, it really does seem to me that the, the idea of the bodies who perform are really kind of critical. And when, especially in India, when we talk about bodies that, that perform craft, they are certain types of bodies that get to be craft artisans, right? Or get to be designers. And they're different bodies and they come from different classes and they come from different spaces, village or city, right? And so, and so it really is kind of connected um, very clearly to, um, to class, to uh, the language that you speak, um, or the languages that you speak to um, to education, not education, you know, not educated. Those kinds of things. They speak very clearly and index those things very clearly. Um, in Costa Rica, that's not quite so clear. Um, there is a sort of indigenous, um, you know, embodiment of craft, but most of the craft that you find in tourist areas is not that. And there's much more pride in um, in in the actual making of things. And artisans are not put on display as often. Sometimes they are painters often, um, but the but 
being able to explain what they do and how they do it and why they do it and that it comes from the heart um, becomes more important as part of that um, in that area. You know, the way I see it playing out in, in my own field of inquiry is that these identities are largely layered and can be very strategic. So for, in the case of Morris, like he could have gone and become a draftsman, but he picked a much high, more high-profile career that could get him certain. He was able to translate his expertise into a particular authority that opened many more doors for him than if he had stayed a, a skilled uh, drafts person. So I think that there is um, there is uh, a politics around skill and expertise and, and authenticity too in that realm. I'm actually going to quickly answer Marilyn's question, because I realize we're moving on. Um, for me, embodied knowledge and thinking about materiality as it relates to quilts or enslaved artisans has really transformed the way I teach and my understanding of um, discipline. So I teach both cultural and intellectual history, and if you were to look at a traditional intellectual history syllabus, it would be Thomas Jefferson, uh, Frederick Douglass, very, very specific names, but I think that when we think about embodied knowledge, that allows us to look at women's intellectual history, African American intellectual history, Native American in intellectual history in a different way. What objects are relaying knowledge, that are recording knowledge, that are making arguments? And so thinking about embodied knowledge in that way has really uh, changed the way I understand the sort of limitations of the canon. And from a contemporary perspective, um, and I guess this, again, speaks to what Alicia was talking about. Um, in Liberia, so much now is, um, so much of what people talk about now is based on existing in a post-conflict, a post-Liberia civil war setting. Um, and I was, to get to Mina's question from last night, I think it was Mina who was asking about, does anybody work in communities that have been displaced? Um, the four quilt girls I work with um, all of those women were displaced through the war, and two of the guilds um, have uh, have been reestablished in towns where they existed that that were completely decimated by the war, and two of the guilds have reassembled in um, UN resettlement communities, um, in sort of bordering Monrovia, and it's interesting because when you I work with a linguist um, who, uh, who who uh, recorded a number of oral histories. Um, in uh, the 1970s and 1980s, before the war, and the way that, and, and he was looking at vowel sounds, <laughs> so it was very different, so he actually recorded talking about quilts, sort of, as, um, as just as people were talking, and giving him oral histories, um, so when you hear people talking about quilts then, it's much more of a, um, it was much more about, oh, well, we do this, but it's kind of old, the kids don't want to do it anymore, mm -hmm. the kids who do do it get made fun of, that kind of thing, you know, because they're doing the old this old work. But now, um, especially in the wake of, of conflict, you find that um, that younger people are are attracted to this type of work as a way of, um, uh, of reassembling uh, histories. Uh, family histories, cultural histories, um, that sort of thing. And, and there's the practice of craft is also um, a, a space in which people can um, discuss their experiences from the war. So it becomes a space for healing, um, both through the actual working together, but also as a, as a safe space to remember um, either people who were lost during the war or the traumas of having to pick up everything and move and reestablish oneself. So, um, yeah, I think it's incredibly important um, in terms of, of, of becoming who those craftspeople and those artisans, those artists are in that moment. Um, if that's one of the many definitions of authenticity that exists, um, I think that's incredibly an important aspect of the, of, of the work that we're doing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful um, opening session and taking the title sort of blurring and crossing. You've all such, done such a fantastic job of sort of blurring this time continuum and crossing geographic borders and discussing this issue. My question maybe builds on the last one, but focuses on using your eyes and mind and heart to look at 21st century craft issues and say like where it's the anonymous maker that you refer to, what, what crosses your radar? 
when you're just, you know, walking around or maybe in transitioning to the places you're going to go back into the past that you that you see that you might want to give a few case studies of or what what's in your mind just contemporary craft issues um, that are of interest. Something that's interesting to me. So I did, I did some work in Australia. Um, related to blackface, but while I was there, I was interested that they have all of these craft markets, sort of like you were talking about, um, on the west coast of Africa, of like Aboriginal art and their paintings. And I started noticing that they were textured. And so I started talking to the women there and I realized that they were actually trying to recreate and preserve the weaving of uh, baskets and uh, textiles that were banned from the boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And so if you touch the paintings, which most of the people who are consuming them don't, you can um, have the tactile sensation of, of how you're supposed to properly weave them. And so I think that there's a lot of things that are on the market that, that have very complex um, legacies that we're not fully engaging with. And so just asking them, you know, what does this mean to you? What, what is going on here? Instead of just thinking like, well, you know, that's red, it'll match my interior design, which was how it was sort of being marketed. Um, there's just a lot of amazing stories to be found. Um, <laughs> and back there. I think first you were Kathleen or Helen. Oh, okay. you want to, yeah. And then it was back. Okay. Um, well, um, this goes back to the methodology question that Mamun started with. Uh, and I'm also with the 21st century uh, question about it, talking to, to people, to makers, about what they do. And I was particularly interested, um, Stephanie, in the kind of questions that you choose to ask, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people who are narrating. And um, I, and at particularly how they self-identify. Um, and that question comes in part from uh, experiences we've had here with an oral history project we, we do with, we call the Bard Graduate Center Art, Craft, and Design, Oral history project because of the whole nomenclature right issue, um, and when we set it up, we set it up on an, a Mecca database platform, and so there are these places where you put in categories right for the people that do, and we were we started out using this thing called the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, and it it broke down immediately because there were no words for like metalsmith or woodworker or things like that. It was like artist, sculptor, architect, that kind of, that kind of thing. So the, so the first thing that the students do in this project is ask the person, what do they call themselves? And I don't know if that's a question you ask or there are other kind of questions that you're finding are, are ones that you come back to? Um, yes and no. Uh, so as, as I'm sure Alicia <laughs> knows from the field of anthropology, you can, you can, there are questions that you want to ask as, as the, in the, the historian, the anthropologist, the art historian, and there are the, uh, there are the things that the person you're talking to wants you to know. Um, so a lot of the questions that I uh, that I ask them are are more of you know there there I begin art historian I begin with the object mm -hmm. always um, you know what do you see when you look at this mm -hmm. can you tell me about you know the first quilt that you made can you tell me about um, these these colors. Can you tell me about going to the market to select fabrics? It's more of like an I sort of get them to begin talking about those things. Um, what I ended up hearing a lot, um, and what I'll, I will say, it's it's you know it's something that you don't necessarily prepare for, uh, especially from the field of art history. Um, what I ended up hearing mostly were stories from the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and, and stories about displacement. There were questions I would never have asked upon the first or second time of meeting someone that were offered up um, fairly straight away. Um, that, that, but they made me think of how, you know, did you, they made me reframe um, how I have to analyze, uh, especially contemporary work, within the sense that, that these exist in a post-conflict world, these, mm -hmm. these objects and these patterns. Um, so I think that um, the, 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 as you're doing oral histories, as you're speaking to contemporary artisans, I think that you can, I'm trying to think how to say this, um, you, can, you can be more vulnerable with both yourself and, 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 and tease out a bit more of those vulnerabilities in the people that you're speaking to, perhaps more than you think you can. 
Um, but I would still begin, again, just by asking the questions um, and seeing where they want to take it. Because um, there were some quilters who wanted, who very much wanted to say, okay, I'd like to tell you about this work. And, and that's where I want to go. And, I, and, and a lot of that comes from, um, uh, from, quilt his, from quilt scholarship, mm -hmm. um, which it bridges a lot of different fields. But um, the American Quilt Alliance, mm -hmm. they have um, a, a, an SOS, Save Our Stories initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is sort of how they begin to train people in asking those types of questions. Um, but yes, I think that, that um, allowing, sorry from anthropology, being reflexive, as Lisa was saying last night, like being reflexive and, be, and being allowed to um, be aware that you're part of that story um, mm -hmm. is, is what we're aiming at and sort of in that contemporary moving mm -hmm. forward. Yes. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Uh, I forget my original question, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but I have, I, I do have a question for you, and I have some primary source information for you. I am curious whether Edward Morse had a child who was born in Amherst over a hundred years ago, who was the executive at Selenese Corporation, who helped Dorothy Lebes develop Florex. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious because how many Edward S. Morse's kind of did? Um, yeah. did he did he marry? Yes. Did he live in Amherst? Yes. So so likely. Yes. Yeah. So it could be his son who went to Selenese and helped Dorothy Lee Bays develop Oryx. Mm -hmm. And I knew him because I'm very old. He died many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> But I, but I but I remember his telling me this story, and he's actually buried in Amherst, Amherst. And he also told me when he was three years old, he put flowers on Emily Dickinson's porch. All right. So if you could look that up, it would be really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Because there is a kind of connection. And my other uh, is, I, I do forget my question. I'm really sorry. But I wanted to tell you that my grandmother made a quilt. And my father said that she started when he was standing at her knees, and when she ended, she was cutting his ties. And the ties came from the Boston Tie Silk Company, and it was started in 1906. She died in 1953. I, the quilt was in our always in our family until three weeks ago when I gifted it to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But I have a feeling that it was shown with the Boston Arts and Crafts Society sometime between 19, 19, 15 or 16 or through the 20s, because that's when she finished it. And I also remember that when I was four years old or three years old, she informed me that she made her dies by grinding mor morning glories in a pestle, in a mortar and pestle and cooking her onion skins mm -hmm. in water. So I just wanted to tell you about that quilt because it's extraordinary. It's That's a crazy right. quilt. And it is in almost perfect condition except for one element. But you should look it up. That's incredible. <laughs> I will ask Phil that. Her name that. is Ida Marcus Williams. <laughs> and she was born in, I think, 1898 and died in 1953. I wanted to uh, first say that I'm so relieved that uh, quilt historians are recognizing that there is meaning in the patterns of quilts. <laughs> because when I was director of the Studio Museum and we were coordinating the um, design for the, the, the uh, traffic circle in 110, uh, Algernon Miller was censored by quilt historians for suggesting that he could do patterns, seating patterns that were based on quilts. So I'm so relieved that this is open. <laughs> the other thing I just want, I know we're gonna like talk about authenticity throughout the conference, because I think this is such a key thing. But I just wanted to sort of think about, us to think about authenticity as also um, create, uh, improv uh, improvisation that creates a new authenticity. I'm thinking specifically of wire baskets in South Africa. I mean, because that was not, it wasn't a marketplace that did that. It was, you know, displaced people away from their homes, wanting to make something, grabbing what was 
you know, at hand, the telephone wire, and, uh, you know, there's stories that, you know, there was a negotiation with the telephone company that they would give the wire rather than them tying down the lines. <laughs> and that, that's another kind of authenticity that with material that has, is not traditional. Also, when I did a lot of um, comparison of baskets and uh, ceramics among the Zulu, I've, I've discussed that there's a lot of cross-dressing. Like, for instance, men are usually doing the baskets and women do the weaving. But we found that there were many instances like uh, where men would sort of go to the women and through resistance, large ceramics, and there were many women doing the baskets. So I think within this whole sense of authenticity, particularly in the 20th century, particularly when we we're talking about communities that are sort of under economic pressure, they have been displaced, that there's a great deal of variety around it that doesn't necessarily follow this sort of autochthonic thing of being, you know, sort of attached to the land. That it's really about the improvisation to survive and keep a creative spirit alive. Absolutely, and South Africa is a really great, especially with uh, <coughs> with ceramics and beer pots specifically, is a really great great space to talk about that, especially the gender crossing over. Yeah. Um, it's so, I went to school with Elizabeth Peril, so yeah. <laughs> that's why I, you know, um, I've heard her talk a lot about it. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot with Liberian quilts because um, it was a practice brought into Liberia by American settlers. Um, and and it's, it's one of the reasons that it was primarily excluded um, from African art histories uh, that, that sort of codified in the field from the 1950s to... Uh, more recently, those dates are flexible. Um, but it is one of those things where when I said I wanted to study these, these, uh, the, the, this type of artwork that's been, that's been made in this space, in this geography since the 19th century, um, there was a bit of resistance in saying, well, is it really Liberian? Well, yes, <laughs> it, it is. And, and I think that that's something that, that, that when you speak to the artists, when you talk to them, um, it's very much tied into um, their life experiences and in these specific places, in these times, and, and it forces us to recognize that we are speaking about continuums and not befores and afters. Um, uh, yeah, and that's, that's, it's absolutely essential. I mean, that we'll definitely be talking about the rest of the day, rest of the weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I know there are two questions left, but unfortunately we have to wrap up and we can continue the discussion, of course, during the break. So thank you so much for, for this panel.